It's April 1989 and this is Comics Comment. I'm your host and fellow comic nerd, Robin Taylor. History is made this month as tens of thousands of Chinese students protested in Tiananmen Square. The Pentium 486 shipped and CERN launched the public World Wide Web. Inferno was still dominating Marvel Comics. And for a quick overview, check out the Inferno episode of Crossover Corner. As Inferno wraps up, this uneven crossover touches the Xbox Daredevil Power Pack and Spider-Man. The X-Books make an interesting swing at tying off a handful of dangling plot lines established in the early 1980s. Cyclops' wife, Madeline Pryor, is revealed to be a clone of Jean Grey, created by the shitty villain, Mr. Sinister. Sinister is used to retcon a bunch of moments in the X history, including how Cyclops and Havoc discovered their powers. I never liked Sinister, and I still don't. I find him to be a retread of retread of previous villains like Apocalypse. I touched on this in the March 1989 episode, but the salaciousness of how the demon invasion is represented by the S&M gear varies between the gritty, sleazy art of Mark Silvestri and the elegant, cartoony work of Alan Davis. Walt Simonson's art seems, just seems awkward drawing thongs and impossible cleavage. Sinister is killed, as is Madeline Pryor, but not before the X-Mansion is destroyed and the X-Men confront X-Factor for the first time. As Liana Rasputin magic is once again a child having given up her powers in order to end a demon invasion she started by accident. Chris Claremont's voice is replete throughout the X-Books, including the odd tone of Wolverine's solo book. Essentially a riff on Casablanca, this issue deals with sex slavery in a kind of gross way that works against the Claremont's rep of writing strong women. Bidey swings through a middling era with Todd McFarlane cutting his teeth on the main book alongside veteran writer David Mishlinney. The storylines are deeply interwoven with the stresses of being part of an adult couple trying to make their way in New York City. The Spidey books feel uneven with Sal Buscema doing old school superhero story and spectacular Spider-Man finishing off the villain Carrion and exploring the impact of Gwen Stacy returning as a clone. John Byrne continues his return to Marvel with West Coast Avengers. I'll be going more in depth on the Vision Quest storyline in a future episode, but the TLDR is that I really like Byrne's way of forcing stories into the edges of Marvel's convoluted history. Peter David continues a remarkable run on The Incredible Hulk, revealing the wants and needs of the new Grey Hulk, Joe Fixit. I'll go more in depth on this storyline in a future episode when artist Jeff Purves runs ends. Iron Man flirts with racism and the return of the Mandarin and is more notable for the art of Dennis Cowan than anything else. A bunch of Marvel books struggle with following the legacy of historic runs of Thor, Fantastic Four, and the Avengers, and none of them find their footing this month. All three are mediocre attempts searching for identity. Finally, in an era I can only attribute to 80s action movies, The Punisher has two separate titles this month and neither are great. War Journal fetishizes gun culture while referring to the DEA as the Defense Enforcement Agency. The main book has Frank face the kingpin and kicks his ass. Most interestingly, this is the beginning of what would become the image style as Jim Lee and Scott Williams handle War Journal and Mills Portico draws the main book. More on the image exodus in the future. That's it for April 1989. Not a great month for Marvel. Will May be better? There's only one way to find out. Join me next time for May of 1989. This is Comics Comment, Excelsior.